You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 248, live from Denver. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, how's everybody doing? <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is fun. This is probably my favorite thing to do when we cover these conferences. Yeah, we've done this for what, three, four years? Uh, it's our third. Year. We've covered the conferences, but this is our third live meetup. Yeah, third live meetup. So, yeah, thanks everybody for coming. I know you might have had other things to do, so it's nice to, to see you come out. Uh, I should explain uh, who's up here with me because we, obviously we're going to open it up to Q&A. But I brought some friends. Uh, to my right, again, as he was already introduced, uh, Pastor Doug Van Dorn, who is local. But this is the guy who wrote the original manuscript for the Handbook for Unseen Realm. So I often get asked, hey, you know, how, how, what's the best way to teach the content in my church? Get his handbook. <laughs> if you go up to Amazon and, and, you, and you find Unseen Realm, it's going to be along there with things that other people you know, people purchased along with Unseen Realm. The cover looks you know, pretty much like Unseen Realm. A little, little bit of a difference there. You'll be able to detect. But he's the excuse me. He's the author of that. And then to his right, we have David Burnett. David managed to come over. Uh, he's been on the podcast a lot. Uh, and if, if you're up here, I mean, you can ask any of us questions. David is uh, here, for, of course, for the academic meetings, uh, Society of Biblical Literature, which uh, technically started today. Um, he's at Marquette. He's in a doctoral program in early Christianity, Second Temple Judaism. And again, if you've listened to the podcast for any amount of time, you should be familiar. And then to his right, if you, how many of you have watched at least one Fringe Pop 321 episode? So we've got a few hands here. Uh, and in the back. <laughs> uh, this is Greg Outlaw. He is the CEO of allaboutgod.com. And he is the ministry partner with my nonprofit, org, to create Fringe Pop. Uh, Greg's specialty is search engine optimization. Allaboutgod.com is actually sort of a, a network of websites aimed at evangelism and discipleship. And Fringe Pop was really his idea. So if you have questions about that, uh, again, I'll probably bring him into the conversation. If you have questions directly for him, please feel free to do so. So that's who's up here. All right. Before we get started, I just want to thank uh, Pastor Andrews and Colorado Community Church for hosting us. We appreciate that. And their friend, Philip, for helping organize that. We appreciate that, sir. Um, and with that, uh, if anybody has any questions, yep. please come up. Here's the mic. It's uh, ready to go. And I should say, at least in my part, it doesn't have to be a biblical question. If you can ask me anything, and if it's personal, I'll decide if I'm going to answer or not. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is James Clapper. Um, I'll start out with a lightweight question. What is your opinions on child demon possession? <laughs> child demon possession. Yeah. So in Mark seven and nine, it talks yeah. about boy, like a boy and a girl who are possessed by a demon. I was kind of wondering, you know, what causes that? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, what causes a child to become demon possessed? Is it an action of the parents or the child themselves? Yeah. So. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, David, if you want to chime in here, you could, but I can't really think of of anything that specifically. I, I don't see the victims of demon possession in the Gospels being blamed necessarily for it. So, I mean, they there's there's acting out as a result of it. So if that's the case, I think my answer would be it doesn't have to do anything. In other words, this is, a, this is a, an occurrence or a happenstance that isn't triggered by uh, something necessarily. Can you think of any example? I mean, I can't. Not in that instance. Um, in, in the synoptics, at least, because John doesn't have any exorcisms, um, there seems to be a sort of genuine understanding that um, despite what the crowds might assume uh, about the people's family or their heritage, um, the demons are seen as oppressors of the person. Uh, so Jesus is releasing them from oppression, and there's no clear etiology for most of the possessions. Yeah. 
like uh, like origin story. There's no clear origin story for it. All we have is sort of the release from it. So it's hard to say. I I, I don't yeah. know enough to. Yeah, I, speak I can't on think that. of any specific example where the the victim is sort of like, well, you did this and this is what happened. How about the idea of like a familial spirit? Would that you think that would relate to it at all? I mean, the, if if we're going by the familiar spirits in the Old Testament, maybe like the Python Oracle and things like that. Uh, we still don't have, you know, origin stories for that. Is that a possession? Is that is that kind of yeah, what you're suggesting? Yeah. Is that a possession? You know, I I, I wouldn't be too troubled by calling uh, such a thing uh, possession because the the person is under the control uh, of the familiar spirit, even though you don't have the same sort of acting out, you know, violent you know, kind of behavior. Uh, but to me, the issue is is control. So I I'd, I'd be willing to sort of lump those things together. So one thing about the Old Testament and demon possession, there really isn't any. Yeah. Um, so the first, unless you're reading your uh, Catholic Bible, Orthodox Bible, uh, the first instance of that is in the book of Tobit in the Apocrypha, mm-hmm. uh, is the first instance of demon possession that we, that we find. Um, so some of, I mean, there's differing explanations as to why that is. Um, some trace it back after the fact um, into certain stories in the Old Testament, but an explicit described possession is until you get to Tobit, which is, you know, at least, what, 150, 200 years before Jesus, something like yeah. that. Yeah. What David said is, is correct as far as, you know, examples, and you use the word explicit. Uh, we did a whole episode on, I don't know what the number of the episode was, but it was on why exorcism is sort of, you know, from the reading of the New Testament, not a surprising component of the messianic profile or perhaps an expected component of the messianic profile. And basically Solomon traditions in the second temple period attribute exorcistic powers to Solomon. And of course, Jesus is the son of David, the son of Solomon, Solomonic line. But that tradition is also linked back to one or two, one or two Psalms where depending on, on the language of the Psalm and how it's translated uh, you you might get a reference to again powers over demons or powers over the powers of darkness, and so that's that's sort of the thread or the trajectory that's followed in the intertestamental period that you know f- moves on into the New Testament. So if that's the case, then you would at least have the idea of demonic oppression and deliverance in the Old Testament, but there are no explicit examples of that. Hi, my name's Nate. Um, this question is actually from a fellow listener named Daniel Wesley. Um, and he writes, I've learned that a common denominator issue with Christian Middle Earth uh, is not understanding the epistemological differences between the modern and ancient world. And he's asking you, Dr. Heiser, do you have any recommendations for how to teach people about these complicated biblical, theological, and philosophical issues in a way that they can approach? Well, I would say if you're if the problem is confusing, let me put it this way: if the problem is reading the Bible through the lens of of uh, a modern worldview, and then finding that to be some somewhat troublesome or in conflict with an ancient worldview, then again, my answer to that is don't read it with modern eyes. I mean, a- application is different than hermeneutics. You know, I, I'm not I'm not an enemy of application, but you know, the, the, the writers, you know, the ancient writers were writing from their perspective, their worldview, with their vocabulary, with their knowledge base, you know, with just the, the way they looked at reality. And they're writing to people that that all applies to as well. So it's, it's an ancient communicator and the communication is being received by ancient people. So it makes sense to me to try to read it with ancient eyes, but still apply it, you know, in, in terms of you know, our situation now. <clears throat> but I realize what the, what the question is pointing to in terms of the conflict is either maybe a, a resistance to that or, or maybe an unease, you know, uh, doing that. But again, you know, for me, it's, this is an intentional decision to at least try to, um, you know, read Scripture, you know, with ancient eyes and then, um, you know, make, make the best of it you know, based upon our best shot at trying to, to see what the writer was trying to communicate. And there are many contexts. Worldview is a big one. Literary is a bit, you know, another one. Um, just trying to do our best with situating the text in its own context and then reading it you know, in light of those contexts. 
and then doing the best we can to make it relevant you know, to our lives. So I, I think the, the answer is you have to make an intentional decision, try to approach it that way and uh, you know, do the best you can with it. I have one more, is that okay? Mm-hmm. This is more practical. Uh, is having a personal relationship with Jesus something that we should strive for? A lot of churches seem to be promoting this idea, yet it seems to be entirely emotionally charged and doesn't seem to have any grounds in Scripture itself. How should we approach this subject and the idea of a relationship with God that's personal? Yeah, to, to me that sounds like the problem is, is an, em, an emotion-based relationship as opposed to something that mixes in a, a biblically grounded knowledge as part of the, the basis for that relationship. I mean, if, if the parent-child, father-child metaphor in the New Testament means anything at all, it has to at least mean some kind of relationship, you know, in a positive way. Um, otherwise, you sort of eviscerate the metaphor of, of any relevance at all. So, um, again, as I hear that question, I, th- I think what, what seems to be the, the target there is having a purely emotional-based reason for doing what you're doing as a Christian or in church or in, in, in you know, again, pursuing, you know, some relationship with God. Or a spiritual journey that that lacks some very uh, specific grounding. That's what I hear anyway in the question. Um, I, do you know the person? <laughs> um, personally, coming going to a church where they're all about experiencing God and the worship seems mm-hmm. really over the top mm-hmm. at times, where it seems more performance based instead of like actually like trying to to worship God, like in a liturgical sense. They do a lot of repetitive stuff that almost looks like you know, a faith healer uh, session or the, the smells and bells kind of stuff. It does, you know, the way you do things and it, it really struggling in that church context because people in my family enjoy that. Mm -hmm. But me personally, I'm sitting there being thinking otherwise. Well, I I mean, I I know people who, who do enjoy that or not and are, are really grounded and, I hate to I hate to put it this way, but the worship sort of seems you know incidental to them. It, it's not it's not really effective them in in a, in a good way. They can either bypass it or just dismiss it or you know think nothing at all of it. Uh, so I, I say that to say this, you know, there if, if if the person really is grounded, it, it shouldn't have that you know negative you know effect as far as this is like destroying my relationship with God. Or because if you know if that's the case, then I'd wonder you know really how much you really understand you know, what's involved in the cross and salvation and, and God's, you know, pursuit of you and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, I can see if you, if you don't have that, then it does become some kind of an entirely, you know, emotionally driven thing. I mean, I, I'm not the most emotional guy, okay? <laughs> You're laughing, Burnett. So, okay, I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you an example, and, and this will probably... Okay. Yeah, you, <laughs> about me or about you? All about you. <laughs> So I got invited to speak at the Frequency Conference a couple of weeks ago. And this is a, was a predominantly African-American gathering. There were 1,200 people there. It was great. I was, I was so glad that, that uh, Dr. Mason, is Eric Mason, uh, his, his Epiphany Church there, was the one that uh, set up the event. He had read Unseen Realm and asked me if I would come. And, and I did. I spoke a couple times. But I stood out like a sore thumb in their worship you know, sir. <laughs> And I'm okay with that. <laughs> you know, I, I, sometimes I like to see people enjoying things like that. And I don't wonder, I didn't wonder in that gathering, if I was in another church where I didn't know that there were a lot of people who were there intentionally that had really, you know, solid theology. And, they, and I mean, these are church planners, these are pastors, these are people doing all sorts of things in ministry that, you know, may or might, may not even be on, on, on the radar. Uh, as far as like publicly known ministries, but everybody was engaged there. It was about, you know, racial reconciliation and unity and, you know, cultural healing and stuff like that. Everybody's serious there. So I kind of like that because I I don't have any, I don't have any nagging suspicion that this is all that there is. In other words, they had substance. So I I felt quite assured and, and comfortable in the environment. It's just that I don't have any rhythm. Okay, I don't have any sense, you know, for something like that. Okay, I know you're just dying to say something. So. No, I want to respond to the, the emotional sort of church stuff. 
Um, I, I come out of that tradition when I was young, too. I think the issue isn't the relationship with God language per se. It's how we rightly understand that language. Because generally in evangelicalism, especially in the South, um, where I'm from, uh, when, when people say to have a relationship with God, what it generally translates to in praxis is a positive emotions, like really exuberant joy, dancing, singing. And then if it's not really positive or joyful, then there's like something wrong with your relationship or something, which is complete nonsense. Um, because it does away with the entire lament and petition tradition in the Bible and in Christianity. And sometimes things just suck and they don't get better. And, and the, the, I mean, we have endless, endless lament Psalms, like almost a third of our Psalms are lament. And yet we sing joy, 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 joy every Sunday. Well, sometimes you don't feel joy. And sometimes God is nowhere to be found. And it's a dark night of the soul for like everybody. And that's the reality, I think, for more people than they would like to admit that are in these kinds of churches. That it's like, if you're not joyful, raising your hands all the time, there's something wrong with your, quote, relationship, Mm -hmm. right? That's the word that gets thrown around. And um, the problem is, anyone with families knows relationships are not always joyful. Anyone with people that feel distance, that feel abandoned, that have been wronged, and that have not received justice. I mean, this is where we cry the cry of the prophets. This is where we cry the laments. This is where we cry... In, in the, the earliest Christian tradition of sanctification is imitatio Christi, in the imitation of Christ. And what does Christ do? He laments on behalf of the injustice that's that's taken place against him and against his city and against the people, against the poor, against the widow and the orphan. And sometimes tears are necessary. Sometimes lament is necessary. Sometimes joy, joy is not. And yeah, joy comes in the morning. Well, it's not the morning yet. (laughs) Resurrection hasn't happened yet. You know, we're still in the wilderness. So it, it, we, I think evangelicalism has to, this is not an option in my view, It has to recapture the lament tradition. It has to. Because what we're doing is, if we don't, is we're saying that the world is okay the way that it is. And it's not. If we're singing joyful all the time, then we're saying we're we're speaking a lie. The world is messed up. And it needs to be set right. And so we... What's the prayer that early Christians prayed three times in the Didache, the earliest example of Christian tradition that we have in catechesis, like what they were being taught in Antioch? Three times a day, they'd have to pray the Lord's Prayer. It replaced the Shema in Antioch, where morning, noon, and night, they would pray the Lord's Prayer. And what did they pray? May your kingdom come in heaven as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven, which means it's not finished. And they prayed it all the time, wishing for it and dreaming for it. And so we have to recapture that lament tradition. Um, It is okay to cry in church. It is okay to be pissed off in church. It's okay to be mad at church. It's even okay to question God. Read David. Read the Psalms. Read every single prophet. Read Jesus on the cross. Okay? Like, this is okay, guys. It's okay to lament. Because God hears that. And he's not beyond questioning. You can question him all day long. You know, read the Psalms, please. (laughs) <laughs> Dr. Heiser, I wonder if you would... Uh, you want to add something? Yeah, want Doug to wants to add something. something. So the original question was about a personal relationship. And if the way these guys have taken it with the idea of, you know, this feeling sort of Christianity, if that's what it's related to, then there's problems. But now take what has just been said about this like full-orbed Christianity where you have all the feelings of humanity being expressed and then take that into the idea of a personal relationship with Christ and it has a totally different kind of a meaning. So, but if we were, if we were able as churches to um, recapture what he's saying, the idea of a personal relationship with Christ would be completely different in the way people interpret it. 
There's nothing wrong with a personal relationship with Christ through His Spirit. And we grieve the Holy Spirit. And like, what's the opposite of that? It would be an impersonal relationship? I don't even know what that would be. So of course we have a personal relationship, but He's the God of the universe too. So Dr. Hazard, I wonder if you would also... Uh, I've invited several people here tonight that are just new to the entire concept of the Divine Council. And I wonder if you would take a moment to give us a summation uh, of that perspective. Mm -hmm. And then would you also answer the question of how much would you say that Genesis 6, 1 through 4, provides the basis of how we should interpret the rest of the Bible all the way through Revelation? I'll, I'll take the second one first. I, I, I think Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and I'll say 1 through 5, because verse 5 is really important, especially in the Second Temple tradition, Second Temple understanding of what's going on there. It, it bleeds into the New Testament in a number of passages. I wouldn't say it's some sort of guiding hermeneutic. I, I would just say that what happens there it, you know, provides sort of a trajectory that is discernible and, and was discerned uh, in the intertestamental period. And, and you can see it. If, if you kind of know what's going on in the Second Temple period, and if, if you're familiar with the Mesopotamian background for Genesis 6, 1 through 5, and you can see how Second Temple Judaism picked up on that. They understood the, the, the earlier context, the Mesopotamian context. So if you know what you're, you're sort of looking at, you will see, again, the, the, that thread sort of leak into a few other passages, you know, maybe a dozen or so. It just depends on you know, really how, how granular you want to get. But it's not, a, it's not a guiding hermeneutic, you know, for Scripture by any means. It's a component. Okay? It's a component... Uh, of, of a worldview, and really where where it, where I would fit it again, because this is the this is a it's not Mike's outlook. It's again the an ancient Jewish outlook. Is it's one of three rebellions. It's the middle one, and the, the fundamental problem that is presented to humanity is not the Nephilim that is dealt with. The Nephilim stuff is really about you know communicating the idea that that supernatural rivals to Yahweh are raising up, you know, and in control of enemies to God's own children to keep them either out of the land or to destroy them. But that's dealt with, okay, in David's time. Look, look who actually deals with the Nephilim problem. You got Abraham, even preceding the conquest back in Genesis 14. You got Joshua, Yeshua, in the conquest. And then you got David. All three of those personalities, those figures, are prefigurements, and that, you know, they're analogs to the Messiah. That's not an accident. You know, but that problem is taken care of in the Davidic era. What isn't taken care of, again, if, if we understand what's going on in Genesis 6, is the problem of depravity. Again, the original Mesopotamian context for this is the Apkalu story. It, it, it accounts for every element of Genesis 6, 1 through 4, and also verse 5. The forbidden knowledge that, that troubled the Jewish writers, and again, the, the whole concept of being in league with chaos, okay, the, the, you know, looking positively toward Babylon, all of that stuff was, was favorable in Mesopotamia. The, the Apkalu and the Mesopotamian story are the ones that gave them civilization. They're the reason Babylon is great. Well, in biblical thought, Babylon is chaos. Okay, Babylon is anything but great. And so, you know, the knowledge that led to the greatness of Babylon in a Babylonian's eye is the thing that destroyed humanity in the Israelite Judaic worldview, okay? The forbidden knowledge is what essentially accelerated and proliferated human depravity, which is another way of saying it taught us more how, how to more efficiently destroy ourselves and to become idolaters. And this is why when you get out of Genesis 6, you've got you know, the giant clan stuff, there are clear connection points back to Babylon, back to the Amorite traditions of the Babylonians, whether it's Og's bed, okay, whether it's the, the term Amorite, which is used also in Amos to describe the occupants of the land. I mean, you, you have hooks back into Babylon because what they're trying to communicate is these are bad guys and 
what, you know, they are part of the reason why the world is in chaos and the place that it is. Okay, you can cut off, you know, the, the Nephilim, you know, thing. Again, that ends with David. But what you don't deal with is depravity. That's the bigger problem. So let, let's go back now to the, this divine council worldview thing. I'll take one step back and talk about the three rebellions. And if you ask the average Christian, you know, why is the world the mess that it is, you're going to get Genesis 3, the fall. If you ask the same thing of a second temple Jew or a literate Israelite, that's not the answer you're going to get. They're going to look at three problems. Okay, there's, the thing, there's what happened in Eden. And the end, you know, we have human and divine rebellion. Rebellion erupts both in God's, you know, family, his heavenly family, the council, and on, on earth. The result of that is death. That's why the leader of that rebellion on the supernatural side becomes associated with motifs about death and Sheol and the Lord of the dead and preternatural spirits that belong in Sheol. I mean, you have all these passages that characterize that event and associate it with death. Okay, the problem there is death. We have to cure that problem now. Then you get to the Genesis 6 thing, and the problem is reception of, of, of knowledge that, that leads to human corruption and idolatry. So we've got to fix that. And the third problem is what happens at Babel. Okay, the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, where God, again, after we've, had, we've had Eden, we've got the flood. Now we've got Babel, and, and, and we're still sort of out of whack in terms of doing the thing that God asked us to do, which was a reiteration of the original Adamic you know, commands. You know, again, God's trying to kickstart what he wants in the first place. He wants to return his presence to earth with a human family, the kingdom of God idea. And so when, when that's resisted, God says, enough. You know, Deuteronomy 32, 8, when the Most High divided up the, the nations, when he set the boundaries of the nations, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. But Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his allotted inheritance. So again, if you've read my material, you listen to the podcast, you know what this is about. God divorces humanity. Okay, we're, we're done, but not quite completely. Because God surrenders humanity, it's as though he abandons the thing he wants the most, again, to have a human family, and said, I've, I've had enough of this. But then he turns around and says, okay, here's what we're going to do. Rather than just like wipe everything off, you know, you know just we're, we're done with everything, you know, permanently, I'm going to go to Or, and I'm going to have a conversation with a guy named Abram. And his wife is too old to have children, which means she's perfect. Okay, because I'm going to raise up a new humanity, a new human family through them. They're going to be originated by a supernatural act of, on my behalf. They're going to become, again, the place where I, again, try to work with humanity to, to kickstart you know, the kingdom of God idea, the reign of God and relationship with God. They're supposed to be the conduit through which the nations are going to come back. He makes a covenant with Abraham and says, hey, it's through you and your seed that all these nations are going to be blessed and be brought back into the family. And we know this story. The point is, if you, if you think that those are the three problems, death, depravity, and now we've got most of humanity on the outs. Okay, they're, they're, you know, they're estranged from God. Yeah, they're under the curse too, but you know, God a- abandoned them. And you know, the, 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 they're allotted to lesser divine beings, lesser gods, lesser you know, sons of God. You know, they're not God, they're placeholders. We don't know when they become corrupt. Psalm 82 is all about the fact that they do. They have a stranglehold on their nations. They put the nations, their populations in chaos and destruction. Psalm 82 is about God's anger with them. He's going to punish them. He's going to rise up at the end. We did a whole episode on this with David. You know, rise up, O O God, and take back the nations, all that stuff. So this is the condition of the world. All this rebellion has caused death, depravity, and estrangement from God. And in the cosmic realm, the supernatural world, you have rebellion. There's going to be death when there shouldn't have. God is going to end. He's going to destroy the the sons of God there in Psalm 82. And now he has rivals. He has enemies in the spiritual world. It's a a total chaos picture. So if 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 you believe all this, if you think all this, when you think about Messiah, what are you going to think? Oh, he's back here to cure Genesis 3. No, he's here to fix all of it. And if you have an eye to that and you read the New Testament, this is why, you know, Paul, again, back to the episode with David, somehow when Paul thinks of the resurrection, he doesn't think, man, I'm going to be at my ideal weight. 
you know, <laughs> I'm going to get the body I want, you know, don't, don't even start, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but instead of that, instead of thinking about the personal sort of effect, in, in, in many cases, the next thought in his head is, yeah, the demise, the nullification, the stripping of the authority of the rulers and the authorities and the principalities and the powers. Why does Paul connect those two things in his head? Because the Messiah rose from the dead, ascended, and that nullified their authority. Well, how does this work? Well, we know that the resurrection, of course, fixes the death problem. That's the one everybody sees because that's the one that's preached all the time. All right? How does it address depravity? Because that's the lingering problem from Genesis 6. How does it fix that? Well, again, I'm of the opinion that this is where the talk of Jesus in his relationship to the Holy Spirit really matters. Because Jesus rises from the dead, he ascends, and why does he need to ascend? Okay, yes, he needs to be on the throne, that, that's part of it. But he needs to ascend so that the Spirit will come. You know, you, you've, got, you've, you've got the Spirit, you know, sent from, you know, the Father and from the Son, you, without getting into that whole controversy about who sends who and all that. But you have the Spirit come to put the capstone, you know, fulfill his part of the new covenant, which of course is obviously linked to Jesus. But what does the Spirit do? The Spirit empowers believers to resist temptation. I mean, it does, the Spirit does a number of things, but that is the way depravity is blunted, okay, and retarded, you know, from, from, from the the domination that it can have. It's through the Spirit that we are able to not be the depraved people that we are. And, and, and all of this is, is conditioned on the, the, the finality, the accomplishment of what Jesus does on the cross and the resurrection and the ascension. This is why Paul you know, mixes the Spirit of Christ with the Spirit of God in some places. It's why Paul refers to the Lord, who is the Spirit, you know, two times. There's this link. You know, and, and, you know, the Unseen Realm stuff is... You know, it's kind of fixated on Jesus a little bit, like as Jesus is but isn't, you know, God. I mean, he is God, but he's not the same. He's, he's not the Father, he's, but he's still God. So you have the Spirit, okay, is but isn't Jesus. I mean, th this is why you have this mixed language about Jesus and the Spirit. How else could Jesus say, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in their midst? Well, it, it's a reference to the Spirit. The, all the talk about, you know, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Well, he can say that because in some way the Spirit is not Jesus and is distinct from Jesus, but in some way he is. And since Jesus is God, the Spirit is also God. I mean, you, you have this, you know, sort of this interchange of, of these figures and these ideas and these persons, but it's the Spirit that combats our depravity. And, and then the third part, how does the Messiah fix the third rebellion? Well, that's kind of obvious. It's the ministry of Paul. It's, it's that focus, bringing back you know, the nations, you know, releasing them from their bondage. You know, Paul goes into a city and it's like, hey, you know, yeah, I know you people really believe. And you know, how many of you heard me tell the story about that pagan podcast I was on? You know, the Voice of Olympus. You don't know that story? I got to tell you the story. So I get, I get this email one day, and, and the email is signed Hercules. Okay, so that kind of caught my attention. He's the host of a podcast called The Voice of Olympus, and he wants me as a guest. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, it's one of those do I or don't I, you know, just <laughs> answer this email. You know? <laughs> so I, I, I replied to him, and here this guy says, I'm a pagan. I worship the gods of Greece and Rome but I just read your little book, Supernatural, and I loved it. Will you be on my show? And so I thought, okay, this will be interesting. And so he says to me when, when we do the, the first show, he says, now, there aren't a whole lot of people that I can have a conversation with. And I, I didn't say it, but I thought, yeah, like, really? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. So... So I, we got into a conversation, and for like the first, I don't know, six, seven, eight minutes of the podcast, this guy's going through Greco-Roman religious texts that articulate the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. That we worship these gods because they were allotted to us, and we were allotted to them. 
And the bigger gods said, no, oh, you worship this one and not that one. And it's, this, it's this rivalry within the pantheon, and it's played out on earth. So he's like, I get it. It's like the same thing in the Bible. And he was so excited about this, and he, so, he says, I have one question. This is a really good podcast show. I got one question. <laughs> he says, if Yahweh, the God of the Bible, is the one that set up this whole system in, in, in judgment, what does he want? It's like, oh, I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> you know, because it, th- this is, I felt like Paul for a day, or at least for an hour. Because Paul goes into a city, it's like, look, I know that you think that if you leave your gods and you embrace Jesus as your Savior, as the, the incarnation of, of, of the Most High, you're thinking, I am just in heap big trouble. The gods are going to come after me. I'm going to be persecuted or killed. I mean, all this bad stuff could happen to me. And so Paul's like, now let's think carefully about this. The Most High is the one who set up this arrangement. And it's the Most High who became a man and went to the cross and died for you and rose again from the dead and ascended. And he nullified the authority that he at one time had given to the gods of the nations. And yes, they rebelled and they turned out to be really awful. But he has now, the same authority figure, has now nullified, deauthorized their control over you. The greater authority, the greatest authority, now says, you come back home and over to my side. I'm the one in control here. I am the greatest power. He will protect you. He will save you. Okay, you are, you are released from your bondage. You are released from your obligation. He wants you to come home. And not only does he want you to come back into the family, he demands it. This, this is Paul's, you know, this is his message. I mean, he, he's speaking the same language as the pagan. I mean, he, he knows, he knows what, what, what they're thinking because they have this shared outlook. So the Messiah is supposed to fix all of this. And you, you're getting back to the summary of the Divine Council worldview, in simplest terms, the Divine Council is just a heavenly host. But there's rebellion there. Okay? And, and it, it plays out on earth in a number of ways. And, you know, you have this... You have this the Old Testament, this is where the cosmic conflict comes in. The Deuteronomy 32 worldview is where we get the princes of, of Daniel, Daniel chapter 10. It's where we get the principalities, powers, and the rulers. and the dominion. These are all terms of geographical dominion. It's not an accident. The Shadim in Deuteronomy 32 that you know, turn the hearts of the Israelites to worship you know, themselves and other gods. You know, it, it's an Akkadian term that refers to a territorial entity. Again, this, this, is, this just makes sense. This is their worldview. And it, 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 it's the backdrop for New Testament talk about what we think of as spiritual warfare. You wanted, I thought you wanted to chime in. Yeah, go ahead. Quote about the Shadim in Deuteronomy 32 that Israel went oh, yeah. after. First Corinthians 10. Yeah. yeah, it's quoted by Paul in First Corinthians 10 in Greek from the Septuagint, um, which reads daimonia, uh, which we translate as demons. But that term uh, in the Greek world, everyone knows. Um, we think of it sometimes looking back through Christian lenses as demons, like little red pitchfork things or something, you know. But, the, the, but if you're in the Greek world, daimonia is a common term that everyone knows from texts like Plato and, and a lot of others, that daimonia are lower tier deities or lower tier heavenly powers that Kronos at the beginning of time separated and put over the nations. Yeah, it's the same world. It's the same term. So when so in the Greek world, everybody knows that those stories. That's the etiology of how all these nations got there, the origin story. And so when the Greek translators of the Hebrew scriptures were translating Deuteronomy, and the term only appears, I think, twice in the entire Septuagint. Yeah. Maybe only once. Yeah, it's it's pretty unusual. Um, it's it is hardly ever used. But it's which is really important because where it is used in Deuteronomy 32 is they chose the term that Greeks would know when they hear that these are territorial spirits, and that's the term that they chose to uh, translate Deuteronomy 32, and that's the text that Paul draws on in 1 Corinthians 10, and says when you're eating in 
idol temple in temples to other deities, right? He says, you're eating with daimonia. You're actually eating with them. And so you're not eating the Lord's Supper. You're still eating with demons. So, and, and the temples are territorial, right? Any major Greco-Roman city has a different territorial deity and territorial spirits. And so it would be a common thing, and we've talked about this on the podcast multiple times, but if you haven't heard this, it, it's a very common thing in the ancient world uh, to go on temple tours. The old, this is normally only if you're super rich. Um, <laughs> poor people don't get to do this. So rich folk will go on these temp, temple tours and you know, all over the ancient world. And if you're a foreigner and you come to a city and you don't show up at one of these big festivals the city throws, which are at temples and dedicated to deities, then you're seen as like this anti-social hater, you know? Like you're not, you're, you're screwing up our economy here. It's like, come on, this is what we do here. You know, take part. And so lot, this is where we get the term, and some of you may already know this, atheoi, where we translate atheist. This is where the term actually originates, is uh, Greco-Roman people would call Jews this because they wouldn't go to the temples. Well, at least the the ones that were trying to obey Torah. Yeah, there, There's yeah. plenty of Jews that did. But J- Jews that were trying to stay faithful to Torah would not go eat in these temples, and they would only worship one god. So because they wouldn't worship all the other gods, they were called atheor. They were against the gods. <laughs> so this is this is the tradition that's picked up by Paul. And says, if you've been rescued by Israel's God, who is the creator of the entire cosmos, and redeemed from those gods, you do not go back in those temples and eat the food sacrifice to idols. Because you're eating with demons, those territorial spirits. They're real for him. Um, So it is a literal redemption, not figurative. They're literally coming out from under the power of that deity. And in celebration of that, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, is is celebrated in Corinth. They say, and they and the way Paul does that in First Corinthians ten, when he talks about the meal, he relates it to Exodus, <laughs> and says that we're eating the same spiritual food that our fathers ate in the wilderness, and the same spiritual drink from the rock with, which followed them, which was Christ. And where did they just come out of? Egypt, under oppression to foreign gods. And they were delivered. And he says, that's exactly what's happened to you Greeks. Same thing. You've been taken out through your baptism, through the waters, out from under the oppression of those foreign deities and under the reign of the one true ever-living God. So that's the image. That's why you don't go to back to those temples, <laughs> you see? So the daimonia are very real. And that's the concept of demon that you actually get in Paul. It's a little bit different in the synoptics, obviously. It goes back to the Genesis 6 thing. But the way demon is in Paul goes back to the Genesis 10 and 11 issue. You know, you you do get that vocabulary. You do get that vocabulary in the the Gospels. But as David pointed out, there's the Genesis 6 uh, connection. It's interesting that the other vocabulary you get in the Gospels helps sort of reinforce that point. Uh, I don't know if you've read... um, I think it's Waddell's study on uh, unclean spirits, you know, but have you ever wondered why, why demons are called unclean spirits? It's not because they make a person impure. It's because they are mixed. Think of the Levitical, you know, rules against mixing things. They, they were viewed as the result of a, of a mixed heritage, human and supernatural. It's why they're called bastard spirits in the Dead Sea Scrolls, because that's what they are. You know, so so the vocabulary again helps you know make this little distinction that that uh, David pointed out. But again, it's it's easy for us to sort of read right over that and not even ask the question: Well, why would they call them that? What would that mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Generally, yeah, the daimon, yeah. So you know, you've it again. It what we in you know, our tendency again, it's because of of you know the broader picture of the West. And the way uh, typically we're taught about angelology or demonology uh, in church, the it's filtered to us through church tradition. And typically, what's done is we take all this terminology and we smash it all together into one thing. And the good guys are angels, and the bad guys are demons, and that's pretty much it. Again, it's a lot more variegated and complex, and I would say interesting and important 
if you're actually paying attention you know, to the vocabulary you get in the text. Hi guys, I'm so excited to be here. This is awesome. Um, <laughs> by the way, love the two, the two Swords podcast. Oh, that was so <laughs> awesome. Changed my view completely. It was like, oh my gosh. Okay. Um, <laughs> and also, I really am digging and have dug the uh, Leviticus podcast. Wow. I know. <laughs> You're a lifer, man. I've, I've listened to it like five times in a row over and over again. Well, we, trying Trey, to soak it in. When, when Trey helped me reboot the podcast, I actually said to him, we're going to start, you know, we're, we're going to do Leviticus like, like real early because if it's still a podcast at the end of that, then we'll know that we actually have something. So. <laughs> it, it, it was really cool. And a couple of, a, a two for question in that. Should, should we be looking at atonement in the New Testament in light of atonement of, uh, i.e. decontamination in the Old Testament? Uh, that Jesus' blood sacrifice decontaminated or was a decontaminating sacrifice for us to approach and be able to be in relationship, direct relationship with God living within us. And that's part one. Two, I'm just trying to clarify. As I understand it, the laws of Leviticus were for temporal relationships, uh, i.e. the community, that the sins were against God's rules for the community, and, and they affected the community, and that the punishments were to protect and reimburse the community. I don't see the laws f- being focused on sinning against God per se as much as the community, although the two are tied together. Obviously, we're breaking God's rules, but those rules, rules were applied to the community. Is that because you are in the community and loyal to Yahweh that you can simply go to God and ask for forgiveness then, although you may have to re- recompense the community in some way? Yeah, that, I mean, some of the laws are certainly proscribing uh, direct offense against God. It's just that, that those sorts of laws end in either exile or the death penalty. So there certainly are laws that are, you know, are, are pointed at a, a direct offense, you know, toward, toward God himself. But I think, you know, having said that, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said again for this, this community aspect and this sacred space aspect and, and whatnot. I mean, you know, Dave and I were looking at each other about the atonement because this is a really big and, and still uh, it probably always will be you know, a, a controversial topic. Um, I, I do, you know, tend to tend to like the notion that, you know, atonement being, again, the wiping away, you know, the, the, the decontamination of the thing that the blood is applied to is sacred space. It protects it from defilement, and, you know, takes care of that problem so that the priest in that case can have access and all that. Um, I, I think that's, that's not so much the difficulty because you could say, well, the New Testament talk of atonement means at least that. But the question is, what else is, is in the picture? You know, yeah, you know, so, and, and there's more going on. And then scholars like to argue about, well, which nuances are there and which ones, you know, which ones are we going to fight over? You know, that kind of thing. Do you, you think you could summarize that? Cause, cause he, he, uh, yeah, you know, David has, a, David has his head in this because of where, where he's at, what he's doing. But give him the options here. Okay. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I can't summarize all of atonement theory in like, yeah, five it, minutes. it's, it's just, um, it's a, it's a quagmire. It's a quagmire. Yeah. Um, Okay. Well, well, I I mean, let let me just, let me do it this way. There's, I'll problematize it that way. That way it'll sort of open it up, you know? So traditionally, um, at least, so it depends on what audience we're talking to, right? So in an evangelical audience, traditionally they've inherited some sort of Lutheran or Calvinistic view of atonement, which generally goes something like, you know, you screwed up, you need, you're, you're unrighteous. You need God's righteousness. He gets your unrighteousness, Jesus. You, you get his righteousness, game over. Well, that's not what atonement means. So if, if uh, um, does it cover those things? Yeah, it, de- it deals with those things, certainly. But if that was all that atonement meant, then why do you make it for land? Did the land, did the grass like, piss off God or tick off God, you know, like, I mean, why do you make it for vessels in the temple? 
right? So atonement must be something bigger than this. So I like the decontaminate word, like purification. He made purification for sins, you know, it often reads. And depending on what translations you read, it gets tricky here too. Um, uh, so the idea of purification, in particular, a cosmic purification, so one that goes from the top down. So um, because in, in the Levitical system, right, you, it's not just blood for the people's sins, it's even for the high priest himself, right? And that's like the final offering goes in. And then the shofar can be blowed on Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement, blown. And, and, and then it'll be announced when the, when the high priest comes out and raises his hands and announces the sins are forgiven. Um, but that's a climactic event that incorporates all of the other things. And in Protestantism, we've gotten really good at talking about dealing with personal sin, and we're really bad at dealing with systemic sin. We're really good about, this goes back, and this is tied to that personal relationship stuff, right? Because atonement is only about making you the individual right before God. So come down, give your life to Christ, boom, atonement, right? But atonement was, it's a systemic issue. It's something that the whole camp has been messed up, right? And you don't just slay the goat. You send one out too, right? And it bears, and it's called a Zazel. <laughs> so now we get into the Enoch stuff, right? The scapegoat, you know, bound. And they really believed, ancient, many ancient Jews really believed in the Levitical code. And we don't know which tradition came first, actually, yeah. the Enochic or the Levitical. But um, uh, <laughs> that the, the, the actual demon, the chief of demons is literally being bound to the goat and sent away. And then in Second Temple tradition, they would make sure it's gone and push it off the cliff, you know? Uh, well, they would. It's like, this is the... So some of this Pharisaic edition was not that bad. <laughs> um, they're like, we're going to make sure that thing dies. Um, so, but, but it's about expelling it from the midst of the community. Right? It's not just about the individual. There are otherwise First Corinthians Paul, five. Yeah. First Corinthians five. I mean it's literally Paul. I, I'm a Paul guy, so I always go back to Paul, but but um Paul hardly ever uses sins plural. Very rarely, if ever. What he doesn't shut up about is sin singular. Something that, that comes in at Adam's transgression, it comes in like this imperial dark cloud over the world, and with it brings death. Now, death doesn't happen to just individuals. It happens to all things, right? So the whole creation in Romans 8 is wanting to be set free, right? Not just people. The entire creation in Romans 8, Paul calls on this, the entire creation is groaning, waiting for the revealing of the real sons of God. And why, why sons of God plural in Romans 8? Have you ever thought about that? Why doesn't it just say at the apocalypse of the Son of God when Jesus comes back? But it says at the sons of God plural, talking about all of us in Christ. Because Paul has this assumption that in the eschaton, what the creation really needs is for righteous people to take it over. Because it's run by a bunch of horrible people. <laughs> And the creation is like, get rid of these stupid empires, you know? We want the sons of God to take over, you know? Um, so we forget about the systemic aspect altogether. And that's, that's, I think, the biggest issue with our atonement theology in evangelical Protestantism, is we're really good at the individual, and we're terrible with the systemic issues. One, one note, then I'll hand it back to Doug. That's important. I hope you were listening carefully. Saying that the atonement is wider than, again, the, the sort of individual associations we have doesn't mean that you eliminate the individual. It just means it's bigger. Because a lot of the, the atonement discourse that you see on the Internet, you know, out there in the wacky Middle Earth is like, you know, it, 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 I often get the impression that it happens just to deny, you know, the individual component. Again, but if you're listening carefully, that's not what he was saying. It's just bigger. To say it's bigger than the individual isn't mean, doesn't mean that the individual thing isn't, isn't relevant and isn't biblical and isn't part of you know, biblical theology. It is. Right. You can't have one without the other. I'm thinking of an analogy with uh, Lord's Supper. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm sure you've heard of these churches that like have drive through Lord's Supper where you can get a little individual packet and drive through the window and then go home. Seriously. Seriously. I've, yeah, I, I know you're serious, but I just... <laughs> Why do I, we take the Lord's Supper? I, what, I, what, is the, what is the Lord's Supper about? It's about taking the Lord's Supper with the body of Christ. And the body of Christ is always two things. It's always the individual and it's the church simultaneously. So, and it's the blood of the covenant. And so that's the atonement part of it, you know, yes. that it's covering the community. Yes, yes, yes. Amen, 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 amen. Um, uh, I, I, I'm really big about the Eucharist, okay? Oh, and and, and, um, and uh, Paul gets to the atonement or the, the Lord's Supper in, in 1 Corinthians 11 right after he's just talked about eating with demons. That's right. And, it, it, okay, this is very, very, very important. Atonement is attached to the Lord's Supper. His death, taking in the blood, taking in his body, right? This is the great relegator of all of mankind. When we individualize the Lord's Supper, we've killed it. Because the Lord's Supper, the great image is all who come to the table, black, white, Asian, Native American, Iraqi, Russian, you name it, Republican, Democrat. <laughs> I'm serious. All have to come to the table. The richest of the rich, the most powerful billionaire in the world, and the pauper living in the box have to come to the table and bow the knee to King Jesus. That is the great relegator of all of mankind. If we lose the corporate vision of the Eucharist, we have lost Christianity. I have to say that again because I know thousands of people listen to this podcast. If you lose the corporate aspect of the Eucharist, you lose Christianity. So box over. <laughs> By the way, the watchers are in trouble for ice cream. That's what we believe. <laughs> <laughs> that was my husband. <laughs> Um, well, thank you all. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Heiser, I want to say that this kind of on a personal note that um, I, my husband, um, has been listening to your podcasts and, you know, for four years now, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it, uh, it really has revolutionized his walk with the Lord. Good. And yeah, it's been, it's been really an amazing experience to, to watch. I kind of tease him sometimes and say, you know, sometimes I hear Mike Kaiser's voice more than I hear yours. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so we've had little arguments here and there, <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for what he's learned from the time that he spent listening to the podcast. And, um, it also has helped us, uh, to be kind of, um, more laser focused in our understanding of faith and, um, that, you know, that as, uh, that it's believing loyalty in Yahweh, yeah. you know, so that's been super helpful for us. I might throw you a curveball here in what I'm yeah. about to bring up, but, um, I had to write my notes down. We were attending a church that had a lot of influence from the charismatic movement. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and some of those more, you know, kind of charismatic aspects, which I'm not condemning that. I just think that there's gotta mm -hmm. be a little bit of balance going on in there. Um, kind of back to that personal relationship and the emotional experience and whatnot. Um, and, uh, and it also had influence, I think from several of the kind of super popular authors of the day that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the prophets and the prophetesses and, um, and again, not a condemnation. I, I don't, I don't know, you know, I, when I get to heaven, I have a lot of questions and, um, I, I, I kind of feel like at least the church that we were in, which is a fairly large movement, um, that, um, it was a lot of the, the new apostolic reformation ideology, mm -hmm. the NAR. Um, but I know that if I were to bring that up and try to kind of present that, 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 that would almost be scoffed at, you know, kind of like, it's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. Um, but my own experience was incredibly painful. And, um, you know, Glenn actually, after hearing about, um, or you, hearing a couple of episodes that you had with, was it Audrey? Well, the first one was Holly. Oh, are you talking about oh. the NAR or, or Fern, Fern and Audrey? Yeah. Fern and Audrey. Oh, Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Right. There's something about Fern and Audrey. Well, there, too, there, there's, there was one overlap because we did a, we did a Fern and Audrey episode where, where 
Beth was on the podcast, mm -hmm. and and she came out of that tradition. So mm -hmm. that, that might be why you're in Mexico. Okay. Um, and and he actually said, "Honey, I think this is what's been happening to you. That, that you know that, that this what you're under." And uh, so we, um, we we we're not with that church anymore. We we needed to leave. But um, I, I found that it became like a kind of a very works based kind of a a thing. You know, if you would only come into alignment with this thinking, or if you would only, um, you know, one of the things that was said just within the last year was, you know, uh, Jesus is waiting on us to return. Which I was like. Well, he was going to wait a long time because we're a mess, you know. <laughs> um, like, if he's waiting for us to get our act together, we're in trouble. The whole world's in trouble. Um, and there's actually very little freedom in that. And so my, my concern is that this is actually kind of a great deception that's being perpetrated upon a large aspect of kind of the charismatic movement, um, but probably not just limited to that. And... Um, Let's see here. I gotta, you know, because, kind of because of that seven mount, seven mountain mandate idea. Mm -hmm. Like we've got to, um, it's on us to present this kingdom now that's been completely conquered here on earth and return it to the Lord when He comes back. Like here, look what we did. And um, I, I just, I think there's some confusion in there. Um, you know, I've spent kind of eight months detangling from it and detoxing from the the lies and things. So I guess my question is. Um, like, do you see a lot of that, you know, just in general, uh, kind of that, that NAR works-based ideology, mm -hmm. um, you know, cause for us, we find it's kind of like, you know, how do we wade through something where it's like, you feel like you're trying to nail jello to a wall mm -hmm. to explain it. Yeah. You know, um, I'll answer that this way. My, uh, my youngest daughter, you know, she had her, her first boyfriend a year ago. You're laughing. <laughs> you, it hasn't you got, come to me I know, yet. It hasn't come to you yet. <laughs> and, you know, it, 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 she dated a guy who was the son of a, a local pastor. And, you know, we knew that the, the, the church had some sort of charismatic orientation. And it's, not, it's not our tradition, but as a, when I think charismatic, I'm thinking like in the 70s, Okay. Yeah, you know, that, that sort of thing. And so, you know, it, it was really, you know, I thought I was, I was sort of filling in the gaps there correctly, but it turns out that I wasn't. Because this particular church was very much what you're describing, and, and we learned that. Really exceedingly manipulative. Um, you know, since, since, you know, my daughter was dating the, the pastor's son. They'd go to youth group, and he'd ask her questions like, why aren't you smiling? You're not smiling enough. You're not happy enough. You know, you're with me, so people are going to look at us. You know, it's just this sort of thing. He would talk to her like he was her dad. Okay, now, I, I, it takes a lot for me to get, like, really irritated. But, <laughs> but, but, but this, this went on for a while, and she would dread getting a phone call or a text from this guy because it would be like half an hour later, she's in tears because she's just not measuring up. And so I actually had to say to my wife, it's like, okay, Drina, you need to go talk to this guy because if I do, it's going to be ugly. Okay. It's just not going to go well. Um, is it, it just, it pushed all the buttons. So what I learned through that, was, you know, to sort of, I, I got kind of drawn into this world. And again, this is just sort of another segment of what we would think of as, you know, the, the charismatic thing. It's not, it's not all, or, you know, it's just, it's, it's a subset, okay? But it, it, it's very performance oriented. You know, and, and you, when you, when you live like that, when you're in that kind of environment, even if you meet the expectations, then the issue is what's next, okay? Because something else has to separate the really spiritual people from the, the people where they're at now. And, and you, it's just sort, sort of starts to accrue different experiences, different, you know, outward behavior, different this or that, again, to, to, to move up the spiritual ladder, you know? And, and so, yes, I have seen that, and it has not been good. But I know enough people within, again, the charismatic orbit that are not that, and in fact, recognize that for what it is. So 
I don't know institutionally, um, you know, how, how big the NAR is because we had Mike Brown on as well. And he's like, most of the people, if, if you went into these churches and you talked about NAR, they have no idea what you're even talking about. And, and I, again, I didn't doubt you know, him when he said that. So maybe it's just people who, you know, are in power positions or maybe it's just an influential author that just gets filtered down some way. I, I don't know. But, but any sort of performance-oriented redefining of the gospel is just really dangerous. It's pernicious. So, yeah, I've seen that. But again, I, I'm not going to paint the whole, you know, movement. Now, what, I, what I've actually seen more of, and I, and I, I happened today again. We actually had, uh, we did a series of interviews. And uh, one of the guys, uh, the, in fact, the last person I, I talked to today, we spent about an hour together after we were done. And he's a, a charismatic pastor. He's a PhD in New Testament, and he was using unseen realm content and just basically wanted to talk about, you know, it was helpful and he has some questions. So we spent about an hour together. And this guy, again, was representative of the kinds of churches that I, I, I seem to keep stumbling into. And that is, well, we're open to the gifts. And so some would call us charismatic, but the charismatics would say, you're not charismatic enough. But the ones who don't like charismatics would say you're too charismatic. So there you go. You know, it, it's just you, you have believers who are open to these things, but they don't drive the bus. And it's not performance oriented Christianity. So I don't know what you call that. I don't know if you can stick a label on that. But it just seems that there's there are more churches that are just sort of content with we're open to God doing stuff and we don't really think that we should expect God to conform to our theology. And if God wants to do this or that, he'll just do that. And that's okay. But we're not going to say, oh, if we see this happen, everybody needs this experience because then we'll know you're close to God. You know, in other words, there's a, there's a clear recognition of the abusive part of it, and, and they're searching for this balance. So I, I actually see more of that than I do the other. That's very encouraging to hear because you know, you can get so locked in to just mm -hmm. kind of what's happening to you. And I mean, I was a little bit hesitant because I don't want to condemn an entire, uh, mm -hmm. you know, group, just say, well, you know, all I, the charismatic I, I tell nuts. people, even in these groups, I say, look, I doubt everything. I'm suspicious of everything, but I'm open to anything. You know, it, it, and I, I, I'm not going to be able to parse your experience. Like, I, I'm not you. How would I know? I wasn't there. I'm not you. You know, but but I want to see the fruit of it. I want to look, and, I, and if, if it's somebody I know, I'll be able to know if you're turning this into, you know, a performance-based thing. Mm -hmm. If you're condemning other people because now I've had this experience and you have, I'll know that. You know, so so my my thing is, well, we'll look for the fruit of it and see what kind of fruit that produces. Mm -hmm. You know, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Hello again. Uh, this one's for David. Um, from Zach, another uh, fellow podcast listener. Are you taking live questions, by the way? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> I got people from the Facebook group that are like, oh, you're there live. Yeah. So this is for Dave. It's a question about his paper on Paul's ascent and angelic torment. So get ready for this one, brother. This what is, is your you? reasoning for regarding a seven-tiered heaven as authentically second temple as opposed to a Mesopotamian three-tiered heaven, which would seem to fit the, which would seem to fit the motif of standing in the council as a sign of a prophet. Can, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, what is your reasoning for regarding a seven-tiered heaven as authentically second temple as opposed to a Mesopotamian three-tiered heaven, which would seem to fit the motif of standing in the council as the sign of a prophet? I don't really understand the question. I mean, uh, I, I, assume some sort of weird cutoff it, in historical reception. Well, it, it sounds to me like at which level do we stand, do the prophets stand? Like, is it the third level or the seventh? Or yeah, like so that? I don't, in my view, and Mike, you can kick back on this, but yeah, I, 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 the reason why I say I don't really understand the question is because the question assumes some sort of essentialist reading of these levels of heaven as it there's one absolute right one and then there's like one app all the others are absolutely wrong and so we look for that essential background to nail down that one uh vision but in the second temple period uh yes paul is inspired so he says seven there but but it's like the in the second temple period there's seven there's 12 there's 
you know, three. There's, you know, it depends on what apocalyptic author you're reading, you know. So I have no idea how many <laughs> levels of heaven there are. I don't know. I just know what Paul says in Second Corinthians 12. And I'm convinced in Second Corinthians 12, in that episode, that he's been to the highest. Um, and because I think the rhetoric, the rhetorical structure of that text is really important because he's talking about boasting in his weaknesses, whereas his opponents are boasting in their strengths. And the reason uh, uh, behind that paper that I gave at SBL and then did the podcast on, uh, the reason why I found the Abrahamic tradition significant is because nowhere else in Second Corinthians, Paul's talking about Moses earlier. You know, he doesn't mention Abraham at all until you get to that ascent text. And then he's talking about the opponents who boast in the fact that they're um, uh, real Israelites, seed of Abraham. You know, he's like, I am too. And then he goes into this, all these horrible things that's happened to him instead of good things, right? That you would boast in if you were the seed of Abraham, you know, get elected by God and given this great inheritance and I've blah, blah, blah. Instead of that, you have this list of horrible things that happens to him. And then, you know, I even made it to the seventh heaven and there's no trampling underfoot because in some of these Abraham traditions, uh, the, the promise of his seed, you'll find that this in rabbinic commentaries on Genesis where, and, and I talk about this in the episode, where, where they think that the promise to Abraham in Genesis 15 is that uh, when he's taken outside, he's literally taken up outside the world. And the reason why they do that is in Hebrew, taken outside, it can mean a lot of different things. But then the term for look can also mean look down. And the rabbis will quote Proverbs 8 when God's looking down at his creation. And so they're saying, so he took Abraham outside the world and he looks down at the stars. <laughs> And he's at the heights of heaven. And the idea was he tramples underfoot the thorn, um, the rabbis say, which were, which were those in heaven whom under heaven fear, the, fear them. And he calls them the thorn. Part of that Genesis tradition of the curse, of being put under like nasty powers, you know, draws on that thorn imagery from, from Genesis and the curse. Because what happens in the end, you tread on the snake, you know, you crush the crushed the head of the snake, you know, so, and thorns and thistles came out in the curse. So this is all part of this uh, fulfillment of the Abrahamic promise of like this great ascent would come with victory. And that's not what happens in 2 Corinthians 12. It, the opposite happens. He receives torment <laughs> from this angel, from Satan, you know. So it's like, it's, it's a sort of a reverse reading. In, in, in my reading of this text, this is a reverse reading of the tradition, saying what you would normally boast in to exalt yourself, I'm actually saying it's, I've been there and I've heard the unutterable words and I've received torment, you know? And so it's like, it's like, even if you're at the highest heavens, it doesn't matter. What matters is suffering with Christ, being with Christ in his infirmities. It's not the ascending to heaven that you want to get to. Like I'm higher than all of you. It's like, no, I'm coming down and I'm serving you, and I'm dying for you. I'm not boasting of my position over you and lording it over you. He's like, I didn't ask for a dime from you, you know? So it's, it's about, I think the tradition, it's sort of not even important for Paul so much. I think it is because he thinks it really happened, and I think it probably happened. I don't know what it means, but <laughs> I have no idea what it means. But so the levels of heaven thing, I'm not sure is that important rhetorically, for what he's doing in that text. So I don't want to get carried away too far into the details because then I'll lose the, the rhetorical context. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you ask me, like, what level's what, pff, heck if I know. I don't know. The, the apocalypse is <laughs> saying tons of different things. So I, mean, I, I would agree with that. I, I think, first of all, I think the question sort of misunderstands the three-tiered cosmology right. because it, the three-tiered cosmology is the heavens, the earth, and then what's under the earth. There's only one heaven, you know, thing there. There's not, it's, the three doesn't apply to the heavens, so you can't really contrast it with the seven. And, and I would agree, because you do get these mixed numbers. I think the point of all the numbers is whoever's speaking has been to the very highest level. In other words, they are, in, they are actually in the presence of God. Okay? So, I, I, again, I think that's the import of it and the number you know, the, the way you describe being in the very presence of God might vary, okay, but I don't view it as a contradiction to the three-tiered cosmology because there's a, there's a disconnect there. 
And I forgot one point there, and I think I made it in the podcast, but just for the sake of the question, there are some scholars who uh, have bought um, the thesis of Paula Gooder, who's a UK scholar on Paul, um, who in her monograph argued, uh, that it's actually titled Only the Third Heaven? Question mark. Um, like that it's a failed ascent. He didn't make it all the way up. And that, because there's different layers of heavens, of the heavens. And so in the apocalypses, and she's an expert on this stuff. Um, uh, so she thinks he didn't make it all the way up, you know, and that that's why he's treating it as a failed ascent. Like, it, you know, I didn't make it, you know, I'm a failed, he's taken that sort of persona of the, of the lowly failed one yet, you know, in my weakness, I boast, you know, so I don't buy that though. And there's some scholars that don't buy that. I think the rhetoric only punches the hardest if he did make it all the way and still he was tormented. So it's like, you know what I'm saying? So I think that's the point of it there. And I think I said seven earlier and I meant three. So sorry. That's see, that's how many different levels there are in <laughs> Jewish apocalyptic. Trust me. If you go down that rabbit hole, oh my goodness. Hello. Hello. I'm Kitty and I just have a one simple question. Um, I've heard you talk about um, the fact that the future of the church is going to be different from what we have today. And I wanted to know what you see as the future of the church. Because you, you, I yeah. think you said that you don't see how it can go on the way it is today. You know, I, you know what I'm thinking, don't you? <laughs> if you want to go there, you just tap me on the shoulder. <laughs> um. You know, I, I, I say that because I, I think the, uh, the, our culture, I think we're transitioning from a post-Christian culture to an anti-Christian culture. I think the, the culture is descending into tribalism. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the reverse mirror image of some of the stuff you talk to with community. I mean, everywhere you see, um, and, and the, the major sort of forces that capture the hearts and minds of the masses are encouraging this process of disintegration and tribalism. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we don't really need to get into sort of speculating as to you know, how this is going to work, but I, it, it doesn't stretch my imagination to think that whether the trajectory makes sense or not, Christians are going to become the focus of a lot of anger um, and again, the, the roads to that point can can be quite diverse. I think they will be diverse. But I don't think it's a stretch to think that Christians, uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 years from now are going to be monitored because of hate speech laws and how, you know, points of Christian ethics might contradict the, you know, the cultural consensus. And in days gone past, it was okay if you disagreed if you, as long as you were tolerant of the other side and you sort of lived and let live, you were allowed to sort of voice, you know, have a voice there. That's going away. Uh, it, it's no longer sufficient to to be tolerant and and allow someone, you know, to have a disagreement. You know, now we have either we have to celebrate evil, or we're in trouble, or someone's going to manufacture a reason, you know, to to demonize um, something. It is either doctrinally or ethically that we think is important. And again, even if people don't understand it, in, in year, years gone by, it was okay, you, you Christians are kind of nutty, but hey, you do good things and we'll leave you alone and we're glad you're here. You know, there's, there's, there's a shift going on there. Uh, if, if you doubt this, I would suggest you read a small book. The author's name escapes me, I, I, but I read it a few months ago. It's called Dangerous to Believe. And, and what's really alarming in, in the book is part of the book goes through how one of the one of the major cultural forces for good, i.e., Catholic social services, has been directly attacked in in a number on a number of fronts and in a number of ways. It, when when you start thinking about the reach of Catholic social services and the amount of good things that that an agency like that does, to have people say, "I want it to die," and I want it to suffer and go away. I don't care how much suffering it relieves. That's you're in a bad place. Okay, if you're doing stuff like that. So the author of the book goes through some legal cases where they've been targeted and whatnot. And they're not the only example. The book is just filled with examples of this. 
So I see a cultural shift coming. And so when, when I think of that, I do believe that we're going to have to, and I wish we would start now, we're going to have to reimagine how we do what we're supposed to do in terms of the Great Commission without things like buildings, without tax exemption, without the freedom to, to post what we think on the Internet or to use the Internet for evangelism. How do we do what we're supposed to do if that goes away or it comes at the cost of monitoring and tweaking? Okay, I mean, we're going to have these decisions to make. We're going to have people in our congregations that train for years and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to become doctors and nurses and PAs, and we're going to wind up in a cultural situation where you must perform an abortion to have a job. Well, then what? You know, I mean, that, how, how does that person get out of debt? You're going to have people lose their jobs. I mean, right now we, you know, we talk about the baker and all that stuff and, it, you know, baking the, the, the cake for a homosexual couple. Should they, you know, should she said, who cares or not? Again, that, that's one example that, that people can disagree about, but there are going to be added examples. There are going to be other things that go in that bucket, okay, where people are going to lose their livelihoods. And, and the church as a community ought to be the place that, pays that person's rent, gets, finds that person a job. I mean, this is what community does, or at least it's supposed to do. But, you know, there are a number of, of obstacles to that. You know, I, I, there's so many rabbit trails I could, I could, I could go down on this because, again, I, I just think that we are going to have to, the church ultimately is going to have to get out of the real estate business. The church is going to have to start reimagining what, what community is. It's going to have to start being creative. One, one thing we could really do is let's encourage people in our congregations to make money, to be entrepreneurs. Because you know what entrepreneurs do? They give people jobs. They hire people. So somebody in your congregation loses a job because they, of you know, some point of their Christianity. Okay, you, you, now you, can hire, you have somebody who can hire them. We look out for each other. But you need people with resources. You need people who know how to manage resources. You know how to, you, know, you gotta have people who can know how to manage people. I mean, you just need multiple skill sets in community that don't think of the community as sort of, well, this is where I apply my skills part time. It's like a hobbyist. They ought to be thinking, this is where I apply my skills all the time. Okay, it's transformative, you know, within a particular community. And this just plays out, you know, in all sorts of areas. Now, Greg, I don't know if you want to get into this. Greg and I have had, let me just tell you how, how we sort of got linked. I mean, you know, Greg had followed my work sort of at a distance uh, without, you know, really identifying yourself, you know, for years. And, and eventually he sort of came out of the woodwork and, you know, helped me do some things. And, and that, that partnership and that friendship has grown. But we had a conversation one day. He had just read my second novel, and in the, in the novel there, there are a group of believers who are sort of, they're in this situation before it becomes kind of a global crisis, but they're, they're forward thinking, and they're, they have resources, and they're using them very strategically to, to do things that need to be done that are really hard or that churches typically don't want to touch with a 10-foot pole, okay? So they're, they're, they're driven to do this. So he had just read this, and we're talking about this. And I said, hey, have you ever wondered, you know, like, how would we do ministry if, if we're not, if Christians aren't allowed to have domain names and, and we can't use the internet or we're censored or we're blocked or, you know, I gave him a couple scenarios. And I, I'm, I'm the technological primitive here. This is his world. What he does for fun is read Google's patents. I mean, literally, that's what he does. And, he, and he, I'll never forget your answer. He goes, oh, yeah, we've thought about it. Is I have a 130-page document on exactly what we would do the day that happens. And this is the phrase you said, when that happens, we're going to throw a switch and we will infect the web. And I said, that's all I had to hear. I'm in. Okay, I'm just in. So I don't know if you want to elaborate on any of that. Thanks, Mike. So, yeah, some of us do have a calling to think about those things long term and what it will look like. And so we sat down and we started praying and then we started writing and figuring out what Google is doing, what Facebook is doing. It's not really so much about what the government's doing, at least here yet. 
it's really the businesses, it's the corporatocracy that are doing these things. So we've thought about what happens when it becomes illegal because we are haters to own hosting. So you don't have you don't have the ability to host a website online. What happens when it becomes illegal for you to own a domain name? How do you handle that? And so uh, or DNS server, which is, is, is a little more technical, but it's when you type in something like allaboutgod.com or mcclot.org, it's what actually reconciles that, that, uh, that entry to the actual IP address and sends it to the right website. So what happens when those things happen? So we've thought about all of those things, and we've planned it, and we even thought about it from the worst-case scenario which is actually, you know, the best case scenario is there's a pre-trip rapture. And we're not here, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's the best case scenario. But, but from our perspective, looking at worst case, <laughs> yes, he's, that's, worst case scenario is what I think about. And I think the worst case is a pre-trip rapture because I want the, the people that are saved during the tribulation to be able to infect the web. And so part of infecting the web is actually all of these databases of websites. So people use WordPress and CMSs and everything else. We're providing them free SEO, free hosting, free domain names, all of these things for free in exchange that they would put the gospel on their website, whether it's a Christian business, a Christian ministry, or anything else. And then if something were to happen, and either the organization that is that is providing this, and it's not just one, it's several, that are providing this, were taken out in some way or put in jail or executed or raptured, whatever the case is, and I don't know, how would we handle that? So you need, a, you need an, an unmanaged solution that is capable of running at least seven years, if it's a seven-year tribulation. <laughs> some people say it's a three and a half right mm. you also need money that funds Doug, this Doug and Dave we thought about how do you, how do you create a, a trust a financial trust to fund this how do you use the latest blockchain technology or technology similar to that to decentralize these things how do you actually take these things and plant them in a place where the antichrist does not have power so like it talks about in a daniel in, in Daniel eleven forty one, it, it's talking about him, and he says he doesn't have power over Edom, Ammon, or the people of Moab. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I know. <laughs> right. So, so whatever the case is, all of these things we don't know. I, 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 I subscribe to the thing. I have no idea what's going to happen in in eschatology. I don't know. So all I can do is I can pray for the best. And I can plan for the worst, and we are planning for the worst, and we are intentional about it, and we have been since 2006 with this document. So we are executing on it. So you, you I mean, you, you would say, though, just so that everybody understands, based on discussions we've had in the past, I mean, the, the eschatological element you're using as an illustration, I mean, you're, this, what, what he's proposing and what, he's, what they are noodling can I use the word noodle? Is that a Pennsylvania Dutch thing? Um, you know, isn't tied you know, to any eschatology. This is something that could, if something happens tomorrow or 10 years from now, where it creates these problems, you have to have some mechanism, again, to, to provide some sort of solution. You know, it, it's just one of these things where you try to imagine again whether whether you know you you link the imagination with you know some sort of eschatological system or not is is incidental and and ultimately unimportant because we could wake up a year from now and the eschatological stuff that you know maybe is expected by a lot of you know popular christianity or different perspectives of it either turns out to be a, you know a myth and a fairy tale or it has no relationship to it at all but you're still in that situation. You're still in that situation. So, you know, the, the technological end is just one example of this because we are becoming so technologically dependent. It would honestly freak people out if they were cut off from some of these things. Uh, what would you do if you, you know, if your phone didn't work, you know, and, and you couldn't do this and you couldn't use that? 
again, you know, you're, you're going to survive. But the question is, the more we get hooked into this, this kind of stuff in our personal lives, and, you know, the more we, we have our churches hooked into it, you know, it's going to have a, a it's going to really freak people out. But the problem is bigger than that. It's not just technology. It's, it's freedom of expression. It's, again, being the target of, of you know, tribalistic tendencies. So, you know, re- regardless of what, of what area, you know, it, it sort of manifests in your mind. When, when, I, when I think about what the future of the church is, I think we're, we're really headed for some serious problems. They may be, again, widespread, you know, targeting of, of what, you know, Greg, you know, thinks about with the technological stuff. It might just be, you know, a financial hit, like removing tax exemption. They're just going to thing, be things that happen to the church that are going to force us to do what we do in entirely different ways. Now, the, there's a flip side to this coin. Again, I'm not, I don't want to sign up for hardship for the church, but I actually think it would have a positive effect. Um, the, the, the church has historically been no stranger to persecution. Who are we? I know. Who are we that we think, you know, we, we have these thoughts in the West like we're, because we're comfortable. I, I've said on a number of interviews, a number of shows, that I, I basically think that the church that's persecuted now and the church in the third world is at some point going to save our butts, okay? Because they have been there and done that. They know exactly how to function. And not only how to survive, they know how to flourish. You know, God blesses them in persecution. I mean, we, we think the church is dying because we're thinking about the West, you know, the, the, you know, the church is over in the UK, they're just museums now or whatever. And that's not true. You know, in those churches, there's, there's a remnant. There's a remnant in all of these places. In, in the third world, even though you can't see it because nobody holds a microphone or puts a video camera in front of it, the, the church is, is growing by leaps and bounds. It's flourishing. It is a, it, it's a powerful force. So we, we have this very insular look, and it, it creates these insecurities and, you know, conspiratorial thinking and all this kind of stuff. You know, and, and I'll grant you, know, there are some th- serious things that could happen, but it's not, it's not the end of the church. It's never been the end of the church. You know, God is going to find a way, and it, it's going to be through individual Christians. I personally think it's a good thing. The state is not going to save us. Okay, that is the kingdom of the world. The state is not the solution. I'm also willing to say that institutional Christianity is not the solution. I think it's been thoroughly compromised and permeated by all sorts of, you know, garbage. In every denomination, whether you're Protestant, Catholic, East, you know, whatever, it's all got problems. You know what the solution is? The solution is individual Christians and the formation of Christian communities that are actually doing their job I mean, that, that, that's the solution. Now, that, that can bubble up, you know, within existing structures, you know, within existing communities, within existing denominations. It's just, it's just going to take a, a, a new round of, okay, we really need to be serious. We need to be Christians in, in the context that whatever, whether it's persecution or not, we have, a, we have these wonderful examples historically. We have wonderful contemporary examples, church under persecution. They, can, they have done the job. And, and we're going to have to we're going to have to rethink who we are, you know. It's just all sorts of battles that are going to have have to take place. It's just going to it's going to be rough. Okay, with all due respect, this is a Mike Heiser event, but I am going to push back a little bit. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I love you. Have, you. He's um, he's the optimist, and I'm the pessimist. No, that's not it at all. Actually, okay, go I ahead. Just, I, he's downing tradition all the time. So oh, I'm going to come back and throw it in his face a it's little the, bit. It's not a, um, it's not a bad thing. Uh, so <laughs> the, the, I think the answer isn't the Christianity needs to figure out a way to a different way to like operate with. No, I don't agree with any of that. I think Christianity needs to remember what it is. Yeah. And that, and that means are. everything uh, this is the basis of the radical orthodoxy movement, by the way, um, is that the, everything that we need to challenge every structure in the world to represent the crucified Christ in the present evil age is already in the orthodox Christian faith. Every tool we need. We just have to use it and know it and understand it. 
and two things I would say. And be willing to suffer. And be willing to suffer. I'm going, I'm getting there. Two things we need to remember uh, to start with the Apostles' Creed and your baptism. And I say this for a reason. Apostles' Creed, uh, if you don't say it in your church, start doing it. Um, this is what all every Christian believed for all time. Start saying it. If you don't know what it is, go online, Google. You have it on your phone. Look it up. It's and it's we believe in one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. That doesn't mean Roman Catholic. You know, it, my Roman Catholic buddies would argue with me over this, but Catholic just means universal. We believe in one universal Apostolic Church planted by the apostles, and it's universal. It is not American. It is not white. It isn't black. It isn't anything other than the universal church. I love this because I see kingdom obsessed over here. Love that. And I love that there's all these nations represented here. Uh, I want to see every nation represented here. Like the, The idea is that we have to remember that. So when we think about, oh, what's going to happen with the church? Normally, as Americans, when we ask that question, we think some of our freedoms are going to be taken away. Oh, no. And people freak out Mm -hmm. while people a few hundred miles away are getting killed. What about Libyan Christians? What about Christians who've been Christians hundreds of years longer than America has existed saying liturgies and wearing things that most American Protestants would think they're Muslim. But they're singing they're singing liturgies that are hundreds of years old. They gave us Christianity, not the other way around. When we ask questions about what are we going to do? Normally that's an American-centric question in, in this country, and it's jacked up because it forgets the rest of the world church and how the world church is suffering elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And oh no, they're going to take another freedom away. Cry me a river. I'll buy, I'll send you a box of Kleenex. Okay. Like the, people are dying. Is, do we actually believe in one universal church or not? Do you remember your baptism? That's the second part. Do you remember your baptism? Remember your baptism. The apostles say, remember your baptism. Why do they keep saying that? Because what did baptism symbolize? Not symbolize, it was the reality. They baptized unto death and raised to walk in newness of life. To live is Christ and to die is gain. My preacher side is coming out. Um, but, but this is important. This is important to remember your baptism. What did you sign up for? You did not sign up for the government to mollycoddle you. You signed up for crucifixion. If you don't like that, there's the door. That's what Christians have to say. Look, it's gonna it's gonna tick people off. It's gonna make people unhappy. But we don't know who the Christians are. Mm -hmm. So this is I struggle with my faith all the time. I'm putting my cards on the table all the time. Every day I struggle. Sometimes I wake up like, is there even a God? Like, but 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 we need to because we need to have something discernibly Christian. And what I think. The Catholic tradition does, the Orthodox tradition does, the Episcopal tradition does, the high churches do, is they preserve those creeds, they preserve those those liturgies from ancient times and f- so that we remember them. So they're not the enemy, okay? If they proclaim Jesus is the Lord of the world, they are not your enemy. You are fighting the wrong people. If you are track bombing Catholics, you are the problem, okay? Uh, we have... A much, much bigger fish to fry, okay? Much bigger fish to fry. So uh, that's my little, you know, pro-Catholic, pro-Orthodox soapbox there. (laughs) Hi, thanks for having me. My name is Ivory, and my initial question was going to involve uh, some of the things you said in your book, and I'm new to your uh, Unseen Realm, so I've been just listening to it about the past couple months, and I was going to ask about the... um, the demons, the the uh, the offspring of the angels and the women, and it's my understanding that you're saying that the the Bible says they are human. They are human. Yet, uh, I guess I, my basic question is: Do they, or have they had? Because the Israelites were told to kill them all. 
So have they, is there evidence that they had the opportunity to um, accept Christ in their depravity? I mean, you had women and children and all of those, and I didn't see, I haven't gotten far enough mm-hmm. to know whether or not that occurred for them as well, because they seem to be, as you said, bastards. They're not from heaven, ori- they're not from heaven originally, and they're not really basically from earth. So, basically, well, yeah, yeah, before you answer that, I, wanna, I was thinking about this earlier for you to, because it's related to this, to um, have a point of clarification for people because you were talking about demons earlier. Mm-hmm. And I think it gets confusing because we use the same word for two totally different types of entities. You're right. And you're talking about one type of entity. Mm-hmm. And you were talking about a completely different type. And I think that that gets lost in people. So if you could, in your answer, help to clarify that too, that I think that would be helpful. The, 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 I, know, I know what you mean by accepting Christ, even though that's anachronistic. You know, did they have an opportunity to become believers? Well, I think, if we, I think if we take the Rahab incident where she says that, hey, we've all, you know, the people of not, not just her town, but, you know, all of this. Okay, we have heard about what your God has done, you know, to the Egyptians and all that stuff. I would have to say, yeah. They could have decided that, that the God of Israel was the God of gods and made a decision, you know, switched their loyalties. And, and we know, you know there are other, other instances where, where Gentiles do this. I mean, my mind always goes to Naaman. It's, it's, really, it's a curiosity to me that, that when Jesus pulls two examples of faith you know, out of his hat, as it were, it's Naaman and the widow of Zarephath. Like, what's that? But if you actually go, I mean, they're, they're, they're both pagans. But they respond correctly to the little bit of revelation that they they you know have come across that or has been given to them providentially, and that's what God wants. He wants loyalty. He wants believing loyalty. Naaman's never going to read Torah. He's never going to do a Jewish festival. He's never going to you know be part of the calendar. He's never going to observe the Sabbath. He doesn't know about any of this stuff. He's going to go back to Syria. But he knows the one essential thing. I know now that Yahweh is the God of all gods, and I will not sacrifice to any other god. He, you know, he has made his decision. So, you know, if, if it's true, if we can take, you know, the conquest narrative that the element that, hey, you know, we've all around here, you know, you know, the, the whole area has heard about what happened at Egypt and people coming out of Egypt and what happened at the Red Sea and. Yeah, they had a chance to, you know, to make a decision as to which God to follow. You know, the, 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 the Nephilim stuff, I'm going to answer that the way I, I actually got this question in, in a conversation you know, earlier today. And there it was a conversation about like, that, that was sort of laced with like science talk, you know, species and all this sort of stuff. I don't believe, and I've said this many times in the podcast, I don't believe that, that the Bible, the, the early chapters of Genesis or really any part of the Bible was given to provide us with scientific knowledge. Okay. I, if God intended, when he, when he tapped you know, somebody living in the second millennium BC and prompted them to write something in a book that would become part of the Bible, if God intended that this, this material, the, the product of, of the person that he chose, was to satisfy 21st century medical scientific knowledge, then God made a really bad choice. Because that guy doesn't know anything. You know, by definition, I don't think, you know, know, Scripture, I don't even think it asks these questions. And so for us to try to answer these questions automatically by default puts us in the area of of speculation. Um, You know, I I don't know if, and and again, like an unseen realm, I say there's essentially two ways to take the Genesis 6 thing and still honor the sort of the supernatural flavor of it rather than just denying, you know, uh, you know the supernatural intent of of what's being described there, and, and and one of those is is again this literal cohabitation. So let's, for the sake of the discussion, let's just let's just go with that. I don't know how that worked. I'm not a I'm not a deity. I'm not an Elohim. So I don't really feel like I have the authority to talk about what a deity can and cannot do. I have no idea. And frankly, neither does anybody else. I mean, if you really believe in the, in the, in the intelligent, that the, that the spiritual world has intelligent beings, they have personality, they have abilities, they have capabilities or whatever, and they intersect with our, in other words, the biblical worldview, 
the Bible doesn't give you the, the necessary information to, to know how things happen. You might as well ask, well, how did the virgin birth work? Like, can I have a scientific explanation? And, and there, I know there are people who, like, who try this, but that just isn't the point. I don't know how it worked. I don't know how God becomes a man. I don't know how miracles are done. I don't know how the virgin birth. I don't know how any of this works because I'm not a God, okay? I'm not a deity. I'm not an Elohim. I have no idea. What I do know is that at the very least, what this material is trying to communicate is supernatural rebellion and conflict that involves the lives of the people on earth, the destruction of the people of God, the you know, an impediment to God getting what he wants, and that is a people in a land, and to bring back the nations, and all the stuff we read about you know, later on. This is, this is an obstacle. There's conflict. There's rebellion, both in the spiritual world and the human world. And I, I can't parse, you know, how that, that works. Now, it's true that, like, Arba, you know, one of the Anakim is called an Adam, you know, a word for a man. Uh, you know, you have one, at least one of the groups called Am, um, people, a people group. That actually doesn't help much because the two angels at Sodom and Gomorrah are also called Adam, but they're angels. They're Again, called Ish. Yeah, well, Ish. Well, there's, there's still a man. And they're, they're still, it's, it's human vocabulary, you know, it, and, and people have tried to distinguish these terms and good luck with that. Um, I'm doing it, baby. I know you're doing it. <laughs> you know, it's just that you, you, these, at the very least, these aren't, these aren't terms that map over to discussions about genetics and species, you know, and, and all this sort of stuff. In other words, to, to sort of be able to, to explain satisfactorily what's going on so that a modern scientific mind is satisfied. I, again, that, that, that's my take on it. I just don't think that, that Scripture was intended to provide that kind of information, that kind of precision. So the ultimate answer is, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know what, what's going on here. I'm, all, I'm content, you know, if what's being described, like I said, in Unseen Realm, the alternative is the mythic view, and that is that the language of, of sexual cohabitation and genealogy and lineage is used specifically to communicate the idea that there are supernatural forces raising up and using human population groups to destroy the people of God. If, if I get to heaven and, that, and I find out that that's what, what really the, the language meant, I'm okay with that. I just don't know. I have no idea. There is one important point besides the ontological point. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by ontological is like how we understand those beings in reality or what is their reality, mm -hmm. you know, uh, outside of the ancient description. And what we do get is the unique theology in the Hebrew telling of this story. Yeah. And that's oh, yeah. what we need to zoom in really carefully on. It, because if these myths exist outside the Bible, which they do hundreds of years before the Hebrews got them um, and after, Greeks have very similar. Because if you've listened to Mike, I'm sure you know, I mean, these sort of mythical archetypes are across the Mediterranean. And, and so yeah. you could say... Mm -hmm. You know, the, the angels that sin are down in Tartarus, right? In, in Second Peter and Jude, this does this. And that's where the Titans are in Greek mythology. Because it maps well mm -hmm. onto that myth, right? But the point was, what, what, what happened in Genesis? Well, the earth was filled with wickedness and violence. That's not the cause of the flood in those other stories. In those other stories, that's not the cause. And you get in Enoch... What Mike has expounded on multiple times, there's a very important thing. Uh, all this like he secret heavenly wisdom they teach them. You know what? One of the things that angels taught them, according to the Enochic tradition, how to make swords and spears and weapons and armor to fight and kill each other. That was one of the things the fallen ones taught the human beings. And so these, these are etiologies. These are origin stories for what you see in Genesis 6. It's like right after this cohabitation happens, the earth is filled with wickedness and violence. So this is Enoch's way of explaining that. And that is the dominant reading in, uh, in New Testament sort of Jewish culture. That's the dominant interpretation of that text. And even from like urbane, sophisticated Jews in Alexandria to like apocalyptically minded Palestinians under the Roman Empire, you know, so it's 
it's a pretty very it's a very common view but that those particular sort of ethical instances and theological differences we have to pay attention to because it gives us sort of the early christian view of how did they see violence you know what were their views on violence why 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 is jesus never fighting back why is paul saying things like never seek to avenge yourself never and he uses the same term that he's going to use in romans 12 uh, for the government in romans 13 saying brothers christians never seek to avenge yourselves he says oh those government they're the avenger so so those ethics are rooted in these stories so we have to be careful not to again i think this is same as that level of heaven question because we can get so caught up in yes but were the demons like this you know you know and forget like what happened in the story right you know so that's my little caveat yeah, and you know the the, the whole the, the chaos element is a big deal again what what a babylonian you know would think oh this is wonderful it brought civilization and order and, and we're magnificent aren't we again you know the the, the judeo christian version of that is no not so much this was a disaster and so yeah I, I agree you know if you if you start sort of looking at the trees and you sort of forget the forest you know you it, it can it can be a little bit distracting but uh yeah one more question hi hello i totally forgot what i was going to ask you <laughs> oh do i need both um I want to thank you, Mike. I've had the opportunity to just become acquainted with your work in the last couple of weeks. Um, just in a nutshell here, uh, my dad passed away three years ago, and both my mom and my dad both survived World War II. My mom was in concentration camp for four years, she dug a hole that allowed her and 21 other people to escape. 11 of those were caught. 10 of those did, were not caught. Of those 10, four were my family. It's just in the last three years since my dad passed that I've found myself wanting more out of my Christian faith. Mm -hmm. And that set me on this really strange Hebraic roots type movement journey. So my question is really, I wanted to preface that by just introducing myself a little bit to you, but my question is pretty more of a personal note. A, have you guys ever been invited to a Messianic Jewish congregation or experienced that? And um, with regards to the divine appointments that I read about in the Old Testament, why wouldn't modern-day believers want to be put onto or accept the idea of being put on a Hebrew calendar, because as we all know, Jesus was not born December the 25th, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but Jesus being a Jew, Yeshua being a Jew, also followed and celebrated and acknowledged all of the festivals. Mm -hmm. So I don't know really how to formulate my question other than to say, why wouldn't we want to consider exploring that? Yeah, I, I, my, I, I've been in um, a Messianic Jewish congregation four times. Um, I have a friend in, in Tacoma who, uh, you know, is, yeah. Uh, no, no, it's, um, it's not the Mark Biltz's congregation. It's, it's much smaller than that. And I, I also have, you know, friends who are, you know, Messianic congregation pastors, ministers, and whatnot, but I haven't been to their particular ones, but I've been in this other one four times. So, yeah, you know, I I don't feel uncomfortable, you know, in, in that at all. I think, you know, I, I actually kind of wish, you know, that our church would follow, you know, the, the Jewish calendar. Um, I just think it's kind of neat. You know, I, I don't have anything against the liturgical calendar of, you know, Christian traditions. Um, you know, I, I know there are historical reasons where, where the two of those have been in good relationship and not so good relationship. And I think maybe the, maybe if you see resistance now, it may just be sort of fear of the unfamiliar. Uh, you, I mean, you might find somebody, I don't know if you had this experience, Dave, where you might find somebody who just doesn't want to do that for some, you know, less than noble reason, but I, I haven't really run into that. But I, you know, to me, I, I don't think it's something that we have to, we have to, you know, deny this one tradition over here in this one calendar in order to do this one over here. Yeah, I mean, because look, look at your churches in, in the New Testament. They're mixed congregations. 
you know, granted, we don't have a lot of the the traditions then that we do now. We don't have a lot of the calendar, you know, issues. Those things came about, you know, trying to calculate the time of Easter and Passover and all that kind of stuff. And then doing the retro version, you know, to get the birth of Jesus. I mean, we you know, there are historical reasons for all of this. You know, to me, the, all of these things are good because they they jar they jar our memories to think about important things. They 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 bend our minds, you know, toward things that you know we need to meditate upon. They they sort of jolt us out of the everyday world and remind us of you know cycles of time and who's in control of history and human destiny and all this sort of thing. And so I, I think I think the you know liturgical Christian calendars certainly do that. I think the the Israelite calendar again helps us to think about the roots of of you know what we're doing here. You know, as as New Testament Christians, this is our heritage. So I, I don't I don't really view any of it negatively, um, but I know people take sides on it. That, that's what I would say to that anyway. First of all, thank you to all of you. Um, this has been so enlightening. I, my question, I'm Sheila. How did this level of understanding of angels that you do so well in the unseen realm and angels, how did that escape so many Christians like me? Um, I'm a theologian. I study all the time in the seminary. Never saw it in this light. Um, and for a new Christian or an, a, an old Christian, um, like myself, experienced, been in the church for so many years, when you quote scripture from the Old Testament through the um, prophets, there's a lot of metaphor and, of course, a lot of prophecy. And so as a new believer, that can be real confusing, like, are we speaking of metaphor right now, or are we talking about prophecy? Now, that's a loaded question, so don't go real deep in there. But mm -hmm. if, if I were a, new, a brand new Christian um, and I and didn't read your books, wasn't exposed to it, how do we as leaders in the church and um, as just lay people get this out? I think, I think we need to... to realize ourselves and then help the people, you know, in, in church under our care, understand that the biblical writers are communicating it in all the ways that we communicate. When we, when we speak to another person, there's no assumption between the, the two people engaged in the conversation that every word that comes out of each other's mouth should be interpreted as the immediate, most literal kind of meaning that you know that, that that should be attached to each word we just don't think that way you know we use expressions we use metaphor you know we use you know colorful language we use you know just any number of figures of speech we we can pick up on that because you know we share the same cultural context and the same language context but the the important point is that People don't. I always think of Dax the Destroyer. If you've seen Guardians of the Galaxy, the guy who can't understand metaphor. Okay, that's how we're taught. That's how we teach people to read the Bible. Do Bible study like Dax the Destroyer, where everything is this the most literal thing you can think of and conceive of, and that that's what's being, that's what what is meant by that. A, again, the, the absurdity of it is well illustrated in you know in the movie, and of course if you read the comics or whatever. We just don't communicate that way. So why would we teach people to not think about what they're reading in the Bible the same way that we communicate? When, when all of these things are on the table, all of these possibilities are on the table. It's not just this literal one-to-one -one correspondent, the most literal thing. Well, that must be. I mean, the, I know there are reasons why for generations Christians have been taught to do that. It's an overreaction to, you know, critical methodology and critical study of the Bible, right? Because we, 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 we think by, by, by training people to think in the most literalistic way that that is the antidote to some of the, you know, some of the problems on this side. But that, that's not the case. What we've actually taught people to do is make the Bible sort of an unreadable thing. You know, so I, I would say that's a really important step. It's actually a really simple one. You know that 
just assume the writers of scripture could, could be using any, any kind of mode of communication that we normally do in, in, in our everyday language or everyday communication with people. Now, to, to pick up what a, what a biblical writer is sort of laying down, you know, what we don't have is we don't have the shared context. We don't have the shared cultural context. There is some, some language, there are some language issues here. If we can only read the English Bible, we're going to miss some things. And, and our English translations are good. You know, basically every committee translation that, you know, you, you could name or use is, you know, they did a good job. No, no translation's perfect. They're all going to have strengths and weaknesses, but they're all going to miss things that if you had a little bit of ability to drill down beneath the English, you'd pick up a few more breadcrumbs. So, you know, getting some ability to do that would help. I often, you know, tell people, look, we would be better off if we read the Bible like it was fiction. And again, what I mean by that is when you read a novel, when you read a novel, your brain just sort of, you know, clicks into place, something goes off in your head that you know what you're reading is intentional. The writer is trying to do something to you. He's trying to make you think a thought for his own purposes, okay? That piece of dialogue, that that phrase or that word, I bet I will see that again. The place where something happens, I bet I'll see that again. I bet that meant something. You know, the way a person was, you know, was, was dressed, that's going to come up later on and, and it's going to take me from this thought to this thought to this thought. You know, we're aware that we could be being misdirected because it's a novel. It's fiction. That's what novels do. And we're just tuned to read a novel quite differently than we would read a textbook or the tax form. Okay, or, or, you know, some other kind of literature that isn't a novel. The the problem is, is we read the Bible like it's a textbook. We don't read the Bible with an expectation that the writer is actually intelligently doing something to us. They're dropping things that we're supposed to notice, and we're supposed to see this, and the writer wants our mind to see this and think about this thing over here. And once we do that, he wants us to connect these two things to this thing over here. Okay. If we did that, if we could, again, just train ourselves to read closely and and sort of click our brains into fiction mode, we would sort of be more accepting or maybe more it would be more intuitive to realize that the biblical writers are actually really intelligent. They have agendas. They have purposes. Agenda is not a bad word. They have something they want you to think. They are guiding you. They are steering you. They are directing you. And, and, you know, when you get tuned into that, it becomes important to, to notice, well, how does the New Testament writer, what does he do with that Old Testament verse? In the you know, Old Testament writers repurpose other Old Testament books, things, you know, using cross-references, looking for what, you know, scholars call intertextuality. You know, I mean, we, we live in a day where we have tools like software. You know, I work for a software company. I don't get a percentage here, so... But, but we have tools that can actually ferret that kind of thing out, that can show you, I mean, you go, go, you go back to David's thing on 1 Corinthians 15, the clustering of vocabulary, you know, in, in, the, in the one, pat, the assumption that it goes back to this creation thing, oh, it actually goes back over here. But he notices this because, again, he's used to thinking, you know, asking interpretive questions like, I wonder not only where that vocabulary shows up elsewhere, like in the Septuagint, but I wonder if there's like four or five ver, you know, words that kind of go together. They cluster together somewhere else. Because when you find stuff like that, that tells you the writer wanted you to notice that because the writer assumes that you have an intimate knowledge of this other stuff over here. So all of these things, I think, you know, help us, help sensitize us to thinking, you know, kind of being in the mode of the writer trying to be in the, trying to recapture the cultural context of the writer, the worldview context of the writer, the literary context of the writer. What, what I'm getting at is, is we, need to, we need to think about, we need to think like the people who actually wrote this stuff and the people who were actually receiving this stuff originally. Again, I, 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 I like to say, I want the Israelite living in your head. I want the first century Jew living in your head. And, and these are, these are simple things. They're not, they're not necessarily difficult. They really aren't difficult. It's just you have to sort of re- do it repetitively. So it just becomes kind of a pattern. 
you know, with you. It, it becomes a reflex in how you approach scripture. I had to learn that. I, I often say I am, I mean, I, be, I became a Christian when I was 17 and I, I knew I had heard of Adam and Eve. I had heard of Noah and I had heard of Jesus. I was tapped at that moment. So, you know, I, I'm like the result of, I'm the cumulative result of like five minutes a day. I mean, when you go to grad school, just ask Dave, it takes a whole lot more than five minutes a day because then you're crushed, you know, with, with material. But the, the, the reality is, is what's important is cumulative effect. Okay, you don't learn anything in five minutes or a day. Anything that really matters, any skill, it's incremental and it's cumulative. So you get in the habit of doing, you know, these sorts of things, becoming this kind of reader. And it really goes a long way. It, it really does. And then you start bringing tools in uh, to help you even go further. Do you want to add anything to that, anybody? I'll kind of address your question um, from, from a pastoral point of view, because I've been teaching this stuff in our church for eight or nine years. And um, so this is kind of just a, a practical thought. Don't begin teaching it by saying, hey, Zeus is real. <laughs> find, find, a, find places where people already believe the worldview, because they do. Um, so an example, um, I was teaching uh, the Giants to a Sunday school group. And uh, one of the guys, was he was just not having a good time with this. And he was getting angry inside about it. Like, there's a moral reaction to it, which I, I find really interesting. And at some point, I finally just looked at him and said, I said, man, don't you believe in Goliath? And for whatever reason, he had never thought about that. He's like, yeah, well, yeah, sure, I believe in Goliath. Well, that's all I'm talking about. It's just that there's a lot more of them than him. Or, or take the idea of um, using, using the language of an angel. So Septuagint will sometimes translate the word Elohim, God, into angel. Sometimes. Now, not all the time, but sometimes. And the point is, as a teaching method, say, look, you, you already believe in angels, right? And almost every Christian believes in an angel. So you can use that as a door to say, it's translating this word here. Now, let's look at how this word is actually used in other places. And you can use that as a way to, to help people. But just, you know, so it's, a, it's being sensitive to where people are, are at. Given the... Deuteronomy 32, verse 8, worldview, that God apportioned the nations according to the number of the sons of God. Number one, can that number of nations be quantified in that passage or within the context of scriptures so as to say how many nations there were, therefore how many sons of God were given rule over those nations? And then secondly, presuming, assuming that that exists to this current time, that those nations are still under the rule and reign of those territorial spirits or sons of God, by what means primarily are they exercising control over those nations? I'll take the 70 question first. 70 is, is the number of the nations because in the Masoretic text, the traditional Hebrew text of Genesis 10, which everybody agrees is the, it needs to be paired with the, the Babel event, okay, in Genesis 11. And of course, Deuteronomy 32 is referring back to what happens in Genesis 11. So if you take the traditional Hebrew text, and you just list it out, it's 70. If you use the Septuagint, you'll actually get 72 because there, some of them are cut in half. And that, that, that's, that's the backdrop, by the way, of why in the Gospels, when Jesus sends out disciples, he sends out 70, and some translations will have 72. It just, yeah, it's, it's a textual issue. It, it, either number points back to the same passage, Genesis 10, the Table of Nations. So that you, you'll see a variance like in study Bibles. So you, you get the number of the nations. Let's just go with 70 for the sake of the question. It's an assumption that the number of the sons of God are also 70 because of the language of Deuteronomy 32.8, even though it doesn't actually state that. 
And it's also an assumption made on the basis of sons of God uh, talk parallels like in Ugaritic and Canaanite literature where the, the numbers put at 70. We don't actually have a biblical verse that says 70 sons of God were put over the nations. It's just that that's just doing the math based upon the number of nations. Right. And yeah, and the Targums do it too. So, you know, that that's kind of all the, all the data that we have as far as the number. Now, the way I would address the other part of your question is I, I am a believer. I mean, I'm, I'm not a numerologist or anything like that, but biblical numbers are significant and they have symbolic value. Uh, they're, they're not just to be overly literalized or only literalized. Uh, you, number, the number 40 is one of these that just occurs all the time. Things happen in 40s, multiples of seven, 70, okay, 49, the whole jubilee, thing, you know, all that stuff. So I look at the number 70 and because it corresponds to the, to the nations in Genesis 10, which would have been the, the known nations, the nations known to the biblical writer, I think that, that the numbering there really signifies exhaustive totality. In other words, that, those are the nations that that was the world as far as the biblical writer knew. And I think that's important because how does that map over to the world that God knows? I mean, the, the theological messaging is that if you're not Israel in the Old Testament context, if Yahweh is not your God, then somebody else is. Okay, every, every nation that isn't Israel is by definition under dominion or subject to another power. And it doesn't matter if it's Australia or New Zealand or whatever nations that the biblical writer didn't know about. The other way to approach that is what about the Great Commission? Go you there and all, you know, all, all the earth. Well, it's very obvious because the gospel applies in other passages, not only to the, to the world, but to the cosmos that the real target of the Great Commission, the real target of atonement, the real target of the redemptive plan of God is exhaustive totality. And so we don't have any reason to suspect or think that just because we only have these nations listed in Genesis 10, that, that the theology there doesn't apply both in terms of evil and in terms of redemption to every nation that, that we know about today. And because it, it extends even beyond that. In, in the language of atonement in the New Testament. So, again, that, that's the way I parse the whole numbering issue. Uh, the Great Commission is comprehensive. I think the messaging of, of the Deuteronomy 32 worldview is, is comprehensive in that if Yahweh is not your God, then, then somebody else is. And this is Yahweh's land. You know, it's linked to the land. And, and when we get, you know, the, the gospel extending out to, to everywhere and, again, even, even to, the, to the cosmos, the whole idea is that Everything is everything that is not loyal and, and, and brought under the uh, brought into relationship with Yahweh, an obedient, loving relationship, a saving relationship. All of the nations need, that that's what needs to happen. That, that's that's what God, you know, would would ultimately desire. Um, you know, redemption is for everyone in every place. Uh, so I, I don't I don't think the numbering impedes or prohibits our sense of totality when it comes to evil and, and good, you know, fallenness and redemption. So like, I don't know what their power and stuff like that looks like, but I do believe this. I do believe that there is something that stops their power, at least in terms of uh, individuals. And that's the gospel. And I think about something like revelation 20 and the binding of Satan so a lot of people think that this is like some kind of an absolute binding. He can't do anything at all. He's in the pit of hell for a thousand years and then he's let out. But that's not what the text says. It actually says that he's not allowed to deceive the nations any longer. And how does that happen? How, is, how does somebody get out of deception? They get out of deception because the gospel comes and a person is released and set free by faith in Christ. And I think that when that happens, you you end up seeing this kind of, it has an effect in the culture. It's not for the culture. It's not like a salvation of a nation. It's salvation of people. But the, 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 the redeemed people go into that world and have an impact on other people. And so the converse is when the gospel is not being preached, then the darkness encroaches again. And I think that that's what we're seeing in our day. I mean, I, I actually, my, my opinion is that the darkness that we're seeing in, in the West is a direct result of the churches refusing to preach the gospel. Good evening, and thank you all for being here again. Uh, my name is Philip, and I just have one, one quick question. Here in the West, we've been raised that our Bible is, is the Bible, and we only 
go to that for directions. Um, it's been said up here, mentioned in the Apocrypha, uh, as well as the Book of Enoch, uh, Jubilees, and there's a few other additional writings. What are your thoughts on us as we gain this new knowledge, um, touching into those other writings? Yeah, for, for the biblical writers, they wouldn't have been new. I, my, my, my answer to this is, is actually pretty quick. I, I, we ought to read the books that biblical writers read because if we do that, we will be more adept at understanding when they drop you know, a few breadcrumbs from them, when they utilize them to make an argument or make some point. It just makes us more intelligent readers of Scripture. So, I mean, I, I realize people talk about Enoch. Is it, should it be in the Bible or not? To me, the question doesn't even matter. I don't, I don't think it's canonical. I don't, I don't really, I don't, you know, if I get to heaven and God says, well, you missed Enoch, it should have been Enoch. I don't really care because I'm going to read it anyway because I know that the, that the biblical writers read it and they use it, they repurpose it. It helps them formulate some point that's, you know, in, in what they're writing. It helps them express and articulate some, you know, argument or you know, polemic or whatever it is. It just helps them express something clearly that their audience is going to immediately kind of know what they're doing with that. So the more I know of that, the more, the more familiar I am with that material, I'll just become a better reader of the Bible. We want to thank Pastor Andrews and the Colorado Community Church again for hosting us. Uh, we want to thank everybody else for coming. Thank you all. We also want to thank our special guests, Doug, David, and Greg. And I want to thank everybody else for listening to the Mecca Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.